topic is a great deal more mundane, I'm going to uh, just remind you about a few aspects of, uh, uh, about heartburn and uh, hope that you will uh, learn the causes and some of the mechanisms that are involved, uh, how it's affecting our life, uh, precautions which uh, can reduce the presence of heartburn, what your doctor uh, might do if your symptoms persist, and the panoply of choices of treatments that are available both over the uh, counter and on prescription, uh, and what the status is of the uh, uh, interventions by surgical techniques, either endoscopically or by open surgery. Now, heartburn has been around for a long time, and this was a contemporary Rowlandson's cartoon uh, that uh, uh, reflects the uh, widespread terminology uh, which has been used to deal with a reflux uh, disease. And at the bottom, you'll see that the term GERD, or gastroesophageal reflux disease, embraces the primary symptom of heartburn, non-erosive reflux disease, which means when a specialist looks down with a telescope, there's no damage to the mucosa, but patients may be very symptomatic. And then the more extreme end, which is when we actually see damage and ulceration. And in the diagram, you can see that there are a number of factors that are associated, particularly a hi hiatus hernia, which acts like a reservoir for the contents of the stomach to sit at the bottom of the esophagus and repeatedly reflux from that site. That's a, a, a something that has been controversial for several decades, but is now much more widely accepted. There are a number of other factors like the valve mechanism or LES not working uh, properly, uh, a decrease in the amount of salivation which is alkaline and which neutralizes the acid uh, and digestive juices from the stomach. And at the end of the day, while there is a mechanistic problem at the junction of the esophagus and the stomach, gastric acid is the culprit that causes the actual damage. And there's been increasing concern amongst people who have frequent, frequent symptomatology because of epidemiological studies that show that there can be a progression which is more common in white males from heartburn to esophagitis to a condition called Barrett's esophagus, which is pre-malignant, and that there is then an increased risk of developing uh, esophageal cancer. Now, the good news is that the actual absolute rate of esophageal cancer in Canada is really quite low, but it is increasing at a rate that causes us concern, and therefore this is a condition that uh, specialists do pay attention to. And you'll see that some 5 million Canadians experience heartburn uh, and or regurgitation of acid uh, more than one day uh, per week. And in a population survey, 17% of Canadians reported heartburn occurring in the previous three months, and 13 reported moderate to severe symptoms at least weekly. GERD patients are therefore, uh, not surprisingly, absent from work something like 16% of the working year, with a workforce productivity loss of 1.7 billion hours, equivalent to $21 billion a year. So this is a very expensive condition uh, that is uh, very uh, common. Now, unfortunately, there's also a relationship between obesity and reflux disease, and uh, we're putting on weight at a rather frightening w uh, rate. And this is associated with an increase in the number of cases of symptomatic reflux. Several studies have uh, recently reported a clear relationship between an increasing BMI uh, greater than 25 and the presence of heartburn and esophagitis, as well as Barrett's esophagus, and of esophageal adenocarcinoma. So if you're a heartburn sufferer and you're overweight, it's a very good reason for getting that weight under control. There are certainly lifestyle uh, factors that affect GERD, but there are many factors in uh, one's diet. High-fat diets are associated with more reflux. Carminatives, which include peppermint, uh, particularly spearmint, uh, are associated with an alteration of the function of the valve mechanism. 
chocolate aggravates it, as of course do citrus fruit juices, uh, caffeinated coffee, cola beverages, onions, tomato juice, uh, and of course any form of overeating. We know that there are a number of medications that people take that can also uh, lower the mechanism, the valve mechanism at the bottom of the esophagus. And there's a range of drugs, and I'm not going to go through them. But if you're on those medications, it's always why, and you have heartburn, it's wise to discuss this uh, with your family doctor. Various other things can also influence the function of the. Uh, lower esophageal sphincter or valve, particularly smoking. It happens transiently in pregnancy, and alcohol also has some adverse effect. But in more recent years, we've been looking particularly at the timing of reflux symptoms, and we find that a very large proportion of people who experience heartburn are experiencing those symptoms at night. And you can see here uh, between 20 and 25 percent of patients uh, surveyed in these two different surveys are experiencing nighttime heartburn. Now, we need to be able to identify those people. And of course, it's uh, those who get heartburn lying down, people who have choking or coughing at night. Those are the very obvious ones, uh, as are waking in the morning uh, or uh, feeling uh, that you've got a bit of a taste in the mouth. Uh, but the uh, thing is that we do know that the quality of sleep is disturbed in these patients as well. Now, we have a cascade approach to management where we emphasize lifestyle and self-management. Primary care doctor will usually uh, initiate uh, a number of uh, investigations only if there are alarm symptoms that are of concern and will usually prescribe a drug to lower acid. Once you get referred to a specialist, which is usually only if the symptoms have not responded well to initial treatment, further investigations may be required. But the vast majority of people who have heartburn are going to respond to very simple over-the-counter remedies, such as Tums or, for example, Gaviscon, which uh, has been extensively investigated. That has a seaweed uh, derivative called alginate in it, which uh, uh, sits on the surface of the stomach uh, uh, contents. And when it gets refluxed, it's the first thing into the esophagus and does exert some barrier uh, effects. When we get to lowering acid, it's quite clear that the PPIs, uh, which are drugs like uh, Losec and uh, uh, Prevacid and Pantaloc and so on, um, are very effective. You can see here in green that they're more effective than the uh, histamine 2 receptor antagonists like Tagamet or Zantac, which are shown in the dotted line. One of the problems is that most people don't take their drugs at the time that they should actually take them. And the absolute critical time is half an hour before the first meal of the day. And in surveys done across the uh, United States in particular, uh, around 30% of people are taking their drugs correctly, others are not. Many of you may have read uh, worrying headlines in the popular media about uh, drugs uh, being uh, 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 bad for you. Um, and uh, there have been a lot of concerns about uh, particularly PPIs. These are actually amongst the most widely used drugs worldwide, uh, many millions of patient years of experience. And essentially, they are very safe. However, as with all medications, one should only take therapy if the symptoms justify it. Then the benefit will outweigh any possible long-term risks. But risks such as an increase in the rate of hip fracture are at an extraordinarily low level and are not seen until about seven years of daily uh, taking of the drugs. And it's important that patients should not be denied the treatment uh, because of these concerns. There have also been concerns about surgery because these are invasive procedures that are not always effective. And one might have procedure-related complications. Even after successful surgery, people may have difficulty with swallowing, they may get uh, bloating and have difficulty with belching or indeed even with vomiting, and their stomach emptying might in fact be also something of a problem. 
And in a 10-year follow-up, about half the patients to 60% of patients still require to take medical treatment. What about the endoscopic techniques? Well, there have been five that have been extensively investigated, and there's often been a short-term benefit from some kind of manipulation within the esophagus to tighten up the valve mechanism, but none has been shown to be effective in the long term. Some patients should have surgery, particularly young patients who have high volumes of reflux or where they have an aspiration, particularly lying down at night, uh, when uh, they may also uh, subsequently get a pneumonia. Uh, but uh, the uh, use of surgery requires a very experienced uh, operator who does hundreds of these on a regular basis. And there are some new tools which are promising, and this is one uh, such uh, tool that is potentially helpful. This is a circular ring of uh, metal beads which are magnetized, which uh, uh, encircle the lower esophagus and uh, can uh, then be uh, um, uh, magnetized uh, or re-magnetized uh, from uh, the external um, environment. Here you can see it at operation being put into place. And here is some of the data that has shown uh, the uh, success in terms of several physiological measurements, but also the proportion of patients who were satisfied after both 12 and 24 months. And this is something that we've not seen with any other similar uh, uh, systems. Are there any alternatives to the drugs that we're currently using? Not really. Alternative approaches are required if the symptoms are not actually related to the reflux of, uh, of, uh, uh, of acid. And then lastly, if you're going to undergo surgery, it's really important that there is a comprehensive and thorough evaluation of exactly what is going on mechanistically in the esophagus before a surgeon alters that forever. Thank you.